So, welcome to my session. I'm Mark Sonnebaum. <coughs> I'm a performance engineer at Acquia. Uh, this talk I put together based on the experiences I have at my job, um, it's a little unique, and uh, the things I see from the Drupal community and Drupal developers in general. So, m my job is actually just to work on internal products at Acquia. Uh, I don't work on out or sites that much, but I do end up getting pulled into it and seeing, seeing a site, excuse me? Louder? Um, is not on? Sorry, I'm tall. Um, all right, I can, I can get closer. So uh, I usually see sites after they've been through a couple iterations of like performance optimizations and tuning, and the problem is, uh, has been worked on before before I see it. And so I've, I've been fascinated in the process of how, how the site got to that point, um, and I've found some things that I'm going to talk about. So this is the typical scenario that I see all the time. So the, the general symptom that we always get is like, well, this page is slow. And really, I, mean, I guess you're lucky to get that sometimes. Um, so really common to just like turn on develop query log, just start looking at queries. And then just from there, you start trying to fix those things you found. And that may or may not have actually fixed it, but you just fix those things because you found those things. And then as soon as you don't have, uh, as soon as you can't find anything else in that one little place, that one little piece of data that you got, you then go to crazy, crazy things like that, right? <clears throat> it's really, I mean, it's almost kind of not funny because uh, I see that all the time, where it's like, you get to a point, and I, I hear slave databases, or read slaves and ESI so much that I almost don't want to use them when they're actually appropriate. So. Looking at a performance problem and fixing it is, is relatively simple. I mean, that's a total oversimplification, but the problem with this is that first one is the most important, right? And that's often the one that people skip. So all of those other steps are dependent on getting that one right. If you don't know what your problem actually is, you'll go on to solving other problems. It's also the most difficult, unfortunately. Um, I, I can't tell you that the collecting and looking at that data and really figuring out what your problem is is simple, but it's also just completely necessary. And uh, yeah, exactly. It's also the easiest to fuck up. So I see that all the time, where you get the you get the data, you maybe look at it the wrong way, uh, you get the wrong data, or you just don't know what data to get to begin with. So. When you do misdiagnose, <coughs> the things that I see most often, uh, I see lots of premature optimization. Uh, so you might see something like, like if you're like if you're looking at queries on a page, it's the thing I've seen a lot where you, um, where you see, okay, this this query is called ten times, and it's the same query over and over. Okay, you might you might help to to fix that to where it only gets called once, but how fast was that query, right? that query might be so fast that it really doesn't matter in the end. Like, you're not going to get much of a gain uh, out of that. So, yeah, and premature optimization, it's, I mean, it's a whole talk in itself. But uh, micro-optimization is sort of the same thing, uh, or actually more of what I was describing. Solving problems you don't have uh, is, it sounds really dumb, but th I see this all the time. People are always solving problems they don't have. Uh, and there, there are consequences, consequences to that. And I get the feeling that, uh, that people perform these optimizations as if they are free. And they're really not. So if you say, like, okay, add a, add a MySQL read slave because it, it can't hurt, right? It can only make the performance better. Except that's not the actual cost to it. The cost is the complexity in your setup, right? Uh, when you when you go around just adding static caches everywhere to things, your code becomes less readable and more bug prone. Um, I don't I don't remember who said it, but uh, remember a quote sometimes was like a, like a cache is a bug waiting to happen, and it's very very true. I mean caches are great, but they make your code more more complex and it's harder to manage. So they're not always the answer to everything. And especially with static caches, one thing we just don't really think about a lot is that you're actually adding a lot of memory overhead to the page. If you have some big result set that you, uh, 
that maybe gets called a couple times um, and you just want to try to avoid that query and you put a static cache on it, it was like, well, now you have that in memory for the entire request, whereas like, you may not have had that before. So static caches are not free. And yeah, for your infrastructure, I mean, adding something like Varnish or MySQL read slaves, uh, I mean, Varnish by itself is, is not that bad, but Varnish with ESI, you have to have a team that can handle that and not, there's very few Drupal teams that I've seen that have, that also have the infrastructure team to manage that. And you, you can get over your head very, very quickly. So yeah, what I'm describing sounds very unscientific, right? So what we're supposed to be doing as developers, this is sort of related to computer science, you'd think, right? Um, but it kind of isn't the way we do it. We, as developers, we really like to use logic and reason why this is the problem. But that's really just totally useless. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how clever you are or like how you can reason into figuring out what the issue is. The only thing that matters is, what, is when you measure it and you, and you have the, the raw data. So this is something, something that I've learned doing this because I, uh, I'm often measuring things and it's like I work with the hosting team and Barry's here somewhere. I'm always, me yeah, I'm always measuring things and then showing, showing data to Barry. And I'm just sort of, I just get in that workflow because I know that if I, if I don't give it to him, he's gonna ask. Um, and when you do that, it's a very humbling experience because you'll find that when you actually measure things, you're wrong 50% or more, usually. And then you see, oh, actually, I thought I knew a lot about this, but I don't actually know. Uh, MySQL is a big one like that. I thought I knew things about MySQL, and it turns out MySQL is really, really complex. So collecting data is the big issue. Uh, I'm going to briefly go, uh, briefly go over just some of the general tools and techniques for, um, for collecting the right data. So if you're debugging just typical response time, like this page is slow in Drupal, uh, like time to first byte before it gets to the browser, uh, profile it. If, I mean, I, I much, much prefer XHProf. I think there's probably no reason to not use XHProf. Uh, anything else is guessing. If you, I mean, you can use the Devel thing that'll tell you how long your page is, but that doesn't give you anything to dig down into. Um, and that's, the, that's actually the thing that I see most, is that for some reason there's just this barrier to profilers. Like how many, I mean, how many people are here are developers? Okay, most. How many have xdebug set up uh, in their environment with like an IDE so you can do like, like debugging? How many have uh, xhprof installed and like ready to use? All right, fewer, this is probably a special room. Generally that's not the case, but and those of you who have set up XHProf know uh, it's considerably simpler than actually getting XDebug working with a debugger. It's not difficult at all, but it's just something that we don't consider uh, part of our standard tool chain. And I've, I've, I do everything I can to fix that. Um, I wrote the XHProf Drupal module, which saves you the step of getting the, like the PHP source from Facebook and setting it up on another vhost. Um, and I'm working on some other XHProf related things to make it easier, but there's still just the barrier of installing that PHP extension. And, it, and even if you don't, uh, a lot of people set it up and just get the report and have a hard time reading it. Uh, I would say even if you get to that point, that's still valuable because then you can give that to somebody who does know how to read it and then they can help you. Uh, but, that's, but getting to that point is really important and I find that's what most people miss. So, most people, I mean, there's most times I ever see anyone do benchmarks, uh, especially on like Drupal.org, they're always using stuff like AB. It isn't awful, but I just wanted to point out that if you're, if you're making code changes, like I just made the small code change, now I'm going to run AB to figure out if it's faster or slower, that might work. Um, it probably will work most of the time, but why would you want to measure that many things if you only need to measure one? You know, that doesn't really make a lot of sense because there's a lot of different ways that that test can get messed up. You can end up with a confounding variable um, that, makes, that makes your test worthless, essentially, because then somebody else is going to do it. It's like, well, I get wildly different results. Like, well, that's because you're testing five different things. And in that case, for code changes, just use XHProf. Uh, it's really easy. Like, 
both the XHProf module and the, the PHP Facebook source, uh, you can give it two runs and you can do a diff between them. And then you can drill down to just that function. And if you've ever seen, um, if you've ever seen any of the core issues where I've done profiling, I always like attach images from XHProf and I always show the, uh, like that particular function and the difference in the time spent within that function. And because, and it's so easy to get, there's just sort of no excuse to, to, to do anything else because you have the data right there in front of you, you just have to collect it. So th this is a really like just a gross over oversimplification, but um, if you're ever doing just like front end, I mean there's a bunch of ways to collect data on front end performance, but I find the most helpful thing that, that I see missed a lot uh, is that uh, people don't know the Chrome dev tools as well as they could. Um, it's, it is the most incredible tool we've ever had for looking at these things. Um, the network tab has been great forever. The, like the, Java, like the actual like JavaScript, um, I forget what the little tab is, but it shows how things are painted. It's really complex, but it's also really, really worth learning. And just if you look at that network graph and understand what the two lines mean, right? The, the document ready and window load event, knowing what those events mean, and if you see that first line is super important. And that one, that's the one that's like, until it's finished, a user cannot really like interact with the page. And so if you see a bunch of requests that, are, uh, that seem to be pushing that one out, that's a good, good thing to look into because you probably have scripts that are like probably at the top of the page that are blocking other content from loading. But yeah, that's, that's obviously an entire talk in itself. But learn that, and, and for front end stuff, really that's, that's the only tool I use. I don't think I use any other tools but that. Yeah. So Firebug essentially does the same thing. Um, and actually, I mean, one, one really great way to, to collect raw data from browsers is in the HAR format. Um, there's a bunch of different ways to collect HARs, but in Chrome, you can actually like right click on the network graph and say export as HAR. And HAR is just a big ass JSON array of, of all of that data. And uh, like the things like web page, if you ever go to like webpagetest.org or like browser mob has their, um, uh, their little checker deal, but all the, all, the, all the sites where you just put in a URL and then it goes and crawls it, they all save HARs, and then they all usually show it with the, the HAR viewer, and HAR viewer is a, it's an open source, like uh, just really simple like JavaScript HTML thing that you just give it a HAR and then it'll show it to you, and that code is actually extracted from the Firefox net tab. Um, so it's good, I just don't like Firefox. <laughs> so yeah, for web servers, just, just please stop benchmarking them. Um, they're, it's really, really unlikely that it's your problem. And people love to talk about benchmark or bench or web servers, and they love to benchmark them and to look at how much faster Nginx is to Apache and whatever. That's awesome. Like, I would love, if you can show me that uh, your web server is actually your bottleneck, that seems worthwhile. But I've yet to see the Drupal site where it is. So I, I, I think it's very, very unlikely. It's more likely that your web server is misconfigured so if you don't have, like, say, like max clients configured correctly, that's sort of an issue, but that's not a performance optimization. That's just configuring it correctly. And so for custom stuff, most, most of the actual measurement I end up doing end up, ends up being custom um, because I end up having to measure something specific to, like, uh, like on the Acquia hosting stack. And um, the only thing I would have to say is that you should always just record the raw values. Um, I see a lot of people will give me data that they collected and they'll give it to me in a format that's already sort of calculated. That's like, it's already it's like an average or it's like request per second or something. And that seriously limits your ability to look at that data later because you're already sort of locked into, into the, uh, the way you wanted to view that data. So if you can get the raw data, CSV is incredibly simple and useful. Um, I also see a lot of people put stats directly in like MySQL. I guess you could, but that seems a lot more complex to me. Um, any scripting language, I mean, you can even do this with Bash. It's really, really simple to just write out data that ends up in a CSV format, and then most good plotting and visualization tools can read CSVs. So just briefly, I want to talk about like the idea of confounding variables. If anyone saw, like probably a lot of you saw like six months ago or so, there's a really good blog post by Zed Shaw, how like, uh, like programmers need to learn statistics or I will kill them. Um, it's worth, worth Googling. And he touches on this a lot. 
Uh, and it's, it's really a huge problem that uh, people don't understand the idea of confounding variables affecting your benchmarks. It's so, somewhat of uh, what I touched on earlier uh, when I was talking about not using AB. It's like any other piece of that stack that you're measuring that's not the thing you're supposed to be measuring is potentially a confounding variable. So, yeah, and here's my completely made up stat on benchmarks on the internet. But you should know, like, you can't always remove all of them. Uh, shouldn't use that as, as an excuse not to try. But it's, I found it's sort of about finding the balance between realism and isolation. <coughs> so, like, if you're doing, uh, like, there's some kinds of tests when I want to set or test a site or, like, a, like a, a whole stack where I'll want to go through and use a tool like Browser Mob and actually make sure that people are going into browsers and everything is happening like it normally would. Um, but that can often be, like if I'm just trying to measure the difference in a code change, that's probably overkill. And there's probably way too many things there that I'm actually measuring. And I'm not isolating what I want to, met or what, what I want to. Um, so I might compromise and just write like a small script that just hits some URLs that I want. Um, but you can, but then if you go to the extreme and then just use like, so say you're tuning my SQL and then you just use something like, uh, like Sysbench, that's great. And you can write down like your, uh, your apps per second and you can show them to people but that may or may not actually tell you that if uh, your, your Drupal site will run better and so it's always about finding the balance of measuring just the exact thing that you want but then also um, also making it realistic enough to where it's still relevant to your actual use case so just the really simple things that I do to try to avoid this uh, work in a known clean environment for me this is this is my MacBook Air um, when somebody gives me a site and says the site is slow, I never ever look at it in that environment first. I always get a copy of it, get it running locally, and I profile it. Because I know if I can recreate that same page load time on my laptop, then it's really clear, I can figure out what it is, even if the time, even if it's usually a little bit faster, um, if it's a couple seconds different, that's fine, because really all I'm looking at, like an XH prop, is the relative times. I can see, well, 70% of the time is spent in this thing. So if I fix that, ideally it's going to be, uh, have the same effect in the other environment. And that's fine if it doesn't. Because if it doesn't and I get it working well locally, then I can move into the environment and say, okay, well now I know that this is an environmental issue. So it doesn't matter so much that, I mean, I'm a completely different OS on an SSD. It's a totally different stack. The only thing that matters is that I know it. And so I know what to expect. And if there is something that's different, uh, I'll recognize it quickly. <clears throat> yeah. So once you get the data, uh, I mean, with tools like XHProf, they have like built-in viewers. Um, but when you're dealing with any kind of custom data or even data from AB, if you are using that, it has like a really good option to uh, export CSV that you normally put in GNU plot. But um, I've been using R a lot. I think it's a really great tool for uh, for visualization. It's not the easiest thing in the world, but it's, uh, it's very worthwhile. Um, because if you, if you get your data in a certain way, like if you visualize your data in a certain way, in R it's, it's much easier to, to view it in a completely different way with, uh, with very little work and very little code. So just out of the box, it uh, comes with its own built-in plotting, um, but then there's, most people use a, a library called ggplot2. Um, it has nicer graphs. This is a pretty shitty example because these are, it makes it look like ggplot gives you pastel. Um, but it's a bit more than that. So, and just uh, a little bit about the different kinds of ways to visualize data. This is something I'm, I have music degrees. Uh, I don't know statistics that well. I'm sort of learning all this myself. And I never occurred to me how different different types of plots are and it wasn't obvious to me initially like which ones were appropriate for, uh, for what kind of data set. Uh, line, I, I always intend to go to lines, and if I, especially if I'm doing time series stuff. I do it less now, but uh, like this is one example where it is pretty appropriate. Um, I was actually measuring, I was measuring the rate at which PHP processes re respond, uh, sent a bunch of traffic to a machine, and waited to see like how, how fast CGI would spawn them. And this was really illuminating because I could see over time how long it takes, like while some, um, while some already got to the max, 
it still took a while for the other ones to catch up, which was which was surprising. But that's specifically a time series thing. And I like to use area for time series, but I think just mostly because it's pretty. I don't think it's at all that useful most of the time. Um, because, yeah, you can just see that it's very spiky. That tells you something. Uh, that tells you there's lots of variation, but I think there's better ways to view that most of the time. So bar is another one that we see a lot. Um, it's a little more complex, though. Um, if you're just looking at data that you usually see in like a bar form, it's probably averaged. Um, I think the better way to view it is like, like this is a histogram. So it's showing you like, so as I measured what percent of memory MySQL was using across all the servers in Aquia Cloud. And so that's just showing me uh, how many there are at each percentage point. And then I just stuck the median line on top of that. Um, but and that's a good example of just like giving R the, like the basic raw data and then it can calculate how many occurrences of that, uh, that there are in the data set. And I don't have to like pre-calculate that. So, like I touched on before with averaging, um, you see this a lot, I see this all the time, where uh, you're presented with data and say, okay, this thing is faster than this thing because I took all of those values and then I averaged them. Uh, especially when you're doing any kind of performance measuring, averages are really inappropriate most of the time. Uh, they're not really telling you the whole story. Uh, so this is actually, this came from data that we very recently collected, like another engineer collected a, some data on the new Amazon provisioned IOPS. Um, and then this is the, like he gave us some numbers and I was like, all right, that's, that's interesting. Like, like, give me the raw data for that because I have a feeling there's, there's maybe more to this. And if you just looked at that, you would say, well, shit, provisioned IOPS is slow. Let's not use it, right? But if you look at it with a box plot, <coughs> box plots are really great. I use these all the time. Uh, it shows you like that big line in the middle, that's the, the median. Um, and I guess I should explain it really quickly. Like a mean is average, median is the point at which 50% of the data is above or below that, which I think is most of the time a better metric to use than mean, but it's good to see them both. <coughs> so that's the mean. The top of the box is the third quartile and the uh, bottom is the first quartile. So uh, all the data fits within like 25% and 75%. And then it also gives you like the lines extend to the min max and then it gives you what it's considering outliers. But from this you can see, so one of the things with provisioned IOPS is it's supposed to be way more consistent. There isn't gonna be a lot of variation in IO, right? That's clearly visible here because you don't even see the box. There's practically no variation at all. Whereas with regular EBS, there's quite a bit. So what you get from this graph is not that uh, one is slower than the other, it's that one is more consistent. And without knowing the standard deviation of the data set, uh, meet, I mean, averages are just completely useless. So, it feels a little silly to put a, a link to like Stack Overflow, but if you are interested in learning R, it's, it is absolutely the best resource. And there's actually a, a special like statistics uh, Stack Overflow, and, and that one book that I've been going through has been really helpful. Uh, there's a huge R community out there, and there's lots of resources. Uh, and lots of help. And uh, I didn't put it in, but I actually just recently started using like R Studio, which is a like an IDE. Um, and I don't usually use IDEs, but it's really great. Uh, and you can put things in this format called R Markdown, where you can it shows you the code like you normally would in Markdown, but then it'll actually embed the plots in it. And then there's a service tied to it called R Pubs, and you can just say publish, and your code goes like goes to the site. It's like gisting uh, graphs. And uh, you can have a URL for that, and then all the data and all your code, and then the results of that are all there, which is really nice, because I can just pass that on and everyone can see each other's work. So I highly suggest checking that.